بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين We begin the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the compassionate the merciful We ask that he send peace and blessings upon our noble and our beloved Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he forgives us of our sins large and small that he have us benefit uh, from these words of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and uh, the ulama that commented upon them and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he teaches of our religion that which benefits us and he push away from us any knowledge that does not benefit us alright so let's just take a look at the time here we were supposed to start at 325 so we're about almost 25 minutes what is that almost uh, yeah almost 25 minutes over and we're supposed to end by 415 alright Bismillah. All right, so uh, we have four more hadith to cover here together today. Uh, the hadith number. Um, Subhanallah, I opened the wrong one. For number forty-eight. Number forty-eight. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sahbihi sallam al maru ma'man ahab rawahu al Bukhari. The Messenger of Allah, Allah bless him and give him peace, said, "A person is with." whom he loves, or with the one whom he loves. Um, and this is a well-known part of a hadith. And um, actually, this, the meaning of this hadith is narrated so many different ways in so many different forms and different hadith that Imam al-Suyuti counts it amongst uh, the mutawatir, um, which are a hadith that have been narrated in multiple different paths so many times that there's no way that it could have been, there's no room for doubt, is basically what that means. There's no word for tawatur that I know, tawatur that I know of. It just means that the lines, the, the, the chains of narration are so multiple that those people could not have gotten in a room together and gotten together and made up something, right? It would have been impossible, right? So, for example, if you had at any one part of the chain, you had people from, Iraq and people from you know Isfahan and people from North Africa and people from Spain all at the same time saying the same hadith without you know communication like phones there's no way that they would have made it and the Quran is mutawatir right the Quran's mutawatir and then there are other hadith that are mutawatir there are not that many so some have it at like a hundred hadith some have it at a thousand hadith and people put together their own collections of mutawatir so Imam al-Suyuti, who, remember, he's the one who gathered a jam as salir and then Habib Muhammad took from it, and then Habib Umar took from Habib Muhammad's book. He actually counts this hadith from one of the mutawatir. And this is only a portion of it. Al-mar'u ma'man ahab. The person is with the one whom he loves. And uh, one of the commentators says, طَبْعًا وَعَقْلًا Right? So he's with him in... Like the type of person he is, his personality, his disposition, intellectually, he's with him. وَجَزَاءً And in recompense, meaning Allah will reward him or punish him. Um, and then mahallan In the place in heaven or hell. Right? So a person is with the one that he loves in all of those different spheres. Whether he agrees with that or not, whether he, he wants that or he doesn't. Whether he's angry with it or he's content with it, that's what's going to happen. Right? And there's another uh, famous narration that says he will be uh, brought back. Yuhshar. He's brought from the dead with the one that he loves. Right? Meaning in the next life, he'll be with him. And this hadith really encourages a person to be with and love the righteous and to connect with them. And to stay away from evil people and people who do evil. And this is, I mean, this, this wisdom of the Prophet يعني مجرب, it's tried and true, right? So if you're around people of bad company, you're going to be like them. And if you're around people of good company, at the very least you're going to benefit from them and hopefully you'll be with them and even better that you become like them. But even if you don't become like them, at least you're trying, right? It's still beneficial, like the Prophet ﷺ, I think Sheikh Abdul Karim mentioned it in the class uh, the other day, I could be mistaken, that it's like the perfume seller, right? Um, or like the one who's working with soot and the like, right? For the one who's with evil. So at the very least, you're going to benefit from the perfume seller and you're going to smell what he has, 
right? Let alone he might give you a gift or, you know, uh, or of the like, right? And vice versa. And vice versa. Uh, another well-known hadith that's similar to it um, is on the authority of Anas ibn Malik that a Arab Bedouin said to the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, when is the hour? And in one version of the hadith, he asks during the khutbah. The Prophet isn't giving a khutbah and the man stands up and he says, when is the hour? <laughs> and the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, continues giving the khutbah and he asks again and he asks again. And finally, the Prophet alayhi said, ma adatta laha? What did you prepare for it? He didn't answer him. He said, what did you prepare for it? And he says, Hubbullah wa rasulih. I love Allah and his messenger. And he says, Anta ma'man ahbabt. He says, you are with the one whom you love. Right? And even if you, if you look at the phrasing, the grammatical phrasing, the way it's like in the past tense, it's, it's even further, um, it's emphasizing it. Right? That it's not, uh, that it's presented in the past tense. And marwa ma'man ahab. He's with the one whom he loves, right? He's with the one whom he loves. Um, and then also, Imam an says, these narrations about the one being with whom he loves and the merit of loving, are about the merit of loving Allah and loving the Messenger, والسلام, and loving the people of piety. Both the living of them and the dead. Imam an -Nawi. So for all those who have something to say, they can say it to Imam al Um And the merit, uh, so we said loving, uh, loving Allah and His Messenger uh, and following in their order, in their command. That's part of loving them, right? And what they've prohibited. And having the character traits that they encourage in the Sharia. And he said it's not a condition of loving the righteous that you do everything that they do. Because that's difficult, right? And if you did that, then you'd be like them. Right? Does that make sense? That's a nuanced point, right? Because doing the actions the Prophet ﷺ encouraged doesn't make you like the Prophet ﷺ. But that's a condition of loving them is to act on what they've commanded you to do. But the righteous, maybe you can't perform what they perform. That's the whole point of the hadith. Right? So that use you, you love them even if you can't perform what they perform. And it's been made clear in the hadith that a person can't perform what they did. Right, and so um, again, there are many versions of this hadith and how it was phrased and in different situations. And what we benefit from it is met many things other than loving the righteous. We benefit that even us in this late age, maybe we can't be with the Prophet ﷺ, but we can love him and that's a form of being with him, right? Or a shiyukh that we love, right? So like the shiyukh that we know, they'll say if you don't benefit from a person, uh, in his absence, then you don't benefit from him in his presence, right? Like our shiuch would say that like, you know, this institution that we've built, it's not the four walls, right? And if you can't benefit from it in another land, then you're not going to benefit from it here. Even though there is benefit in physically sitting with somebody, right? It's, it, there's benefit, but to act like because you're not with him or you're not with them, that you're not benefiting at all, then that's just a bad opinion of Allah. It's a bad opinion of the Messenger, والسلام, it's a bad opinion of the Shiuch, it's a bad opinion, it's a misunderstanding and a misapplication of the religion. Right? Do you see, are there somewhere that the, I guess the Prophet said, he said he complimented the people who didn't see him? Yeah. You know, yeah. That, that that's right. They, they believe, but they didn't. They didn't yeah, his beloved, his brothers. Right, are the people who, um, who did not see him. And then the Sahaba said, you know, aren't we those people? And he said, no, you're my companions. Yeah, but they'll come after me and they will not have seen me. Right? And, they, and in one version he says, they're willing to give up everything they own for just a moment to see me. Right? And so that love is real and they're not allowed to be with the Prophet ﷺ. And Allah make us of them. Allah make us of them. And in a way, we're with these people every time we're present with them in mind, right? 
So like one of our shaykh recently said, okay, every time you send salawat, you're with the Prophet wassalam, if you believe what the Prophet said. Because you're in prayer, you're saying, As-salamu alayka ayyuhan nabi. Peace be upon you, O Messenger of God. And he's returned and responds. But it's just, it's a lack of consciousness is on our own part, right? But it's there. And you benefit, the good thing is the rahmah, the mercy is you benefit whether you're aware of it or not. But you benefit more the more that you're aware. Right? You benefit more the more that you're aware. Right? So uh, the commentator ha says, uh, a man came to the Messenger of Allah in the full version of the Hadith. He says, oh Messenger of God, what do you say about a man who loves a group of people but never caught up with them? Right? To which the Prophet ﷺ said, responded saying, a person's with the one he loves. So caught up with them, they say, can have multiple meanings. One of the meanings is never joined with them in the world, meaning that they heard of their virtue and piety but never had the opportunity to sit with them. Right? Um... Or two, did not have the same rank as them in terms of good works and piety, but loved them for their piety and rank with God the exalted. In other words, a group will be united with those whom he or she loves in the hereafter. This does not mean that they have the same rank with God as those who excel due to their righteous works, but because of their love for, good, for the righteous, God will unite them together in paradise. Right? So just because you love them doesn't mean that you're of the same rank, but Allah, out of his mercy and his compassion, right, will unite you with them because you love them. Right? Loving the righteous and seeking their company is extremely important in this life, in the life of the believer, especially in today's world. And that is why God, blessed and exalted as he, commands us in the Quran to seek righteous company. You who believe, be mindful of God and be with those who are true. And the Messenger of Allah said, a man is on the religion of his close friend, so consider well who you, whom you closely befriend. Right? And so on and so forth. Um, and so, you know, the merit, uh, excuse me, the moral of the story, the moral of the hadith is clear, to be around the ones who are righteous, to love them, to tell your children about them, to tell your friends about them. Stories are extremely powerful. They're extremely powerful, you know, but more powerful than anything is just to see righteous people um, and to be around them. And inshallah, you know, these lands will be filled with those types of people. That's what we really hope. Because those, that's the real, like, if you're looking for a solution to the world's problems, it's just those type of people, right? Because they really change the area um, on an unseen level and in a seen way, right? Um, otherwise, what ends up happening is the people who are seeking change, they might be able to change some things for good, but they end up bringing a lot of other negativities as well, right? So you overthrow the leader, and then you put in yourself, and then you end up being worse than the leader that you overthrew, right? Or you seek to change uh, an institution a certain way and you bring its own negativities. The only way is that if you yourself are changed and then you seek to change the area, then it changes for the better. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite, uh, unite us with those people. Any questions about this hadith before we move to the next one? Yeah, uh, go ahead. Ala. So what does this hadith mean for the people that you love that aren't uh, necessarily Muslim or don't do righteous things? Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's a good question. Ala, so Allah is asking, what does it mean about loving people who are not Muslims or loving people who are not doing righteous things? It depends what you love about them, right? So as long as you don't love their their lack of piety, or you don't love their disbelief, right? Then it's not an issue, right? So if you love them because they're your family member. Right? And Allah commanded you to love your family members. Definitely we're not saying don't love your family members and they're not a believer. Right? Or they're your family member and they're doing corrupt things. Right? Um, you should still love them, but you don't love their, their impiety and their actions. Yeah. And Sayyidina Mu'adh actually said that after Islam, there was not a moment that we were more happy than this statement of the Prophet ﷺ because we knew that we didn't have a lot of praying, we didn't have a lot of fasting, but we knew we loved the Prophet ﷺ. Yeah, go ahead, Christina. Isn't it even a good thought to just make sure that you um, constantly try to be a better person because of those people that may not be um, doing righteous deeds or things like that? Like, wouldn't or is that just too much pressure to put on yourself? Like, what do you? Yeah, can you explain? Like if they're, if you know, I love my brother. He's not a Muslim. Yeah. And um, I know that he loves me. Yeah. Wouldn't it be better for me to just constantly try to be striving towards the good so that even if I die? And he dies, and you know it's judgment day. 
that Allah will somehow impact him positively through you. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. And, uh, you know, I think, yeah, I think, I think it's very, very powerful, you know. Yeah, it's very powerful. Yeah, Allah rewards you. Any other questions? Okay, so Hadith 49, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ نِعْمَ الْإِدَامِ الْخَلْ رواه مسلم. The Messenger of Allah Ali Sallallahu Alaihi said, and Amjad translates it as a fine condiment or what a great condiment vinegar is. So the commentators here, it's interesting, they kind of are pushing you away from the thought that necessarily vinegar in and of itself is better than other things, right? But you have to kind of understand the context of the hadith. Right, in which the Prophet ﷺ asked if there was anything to eat with his bread. And then his wife said, all I have is vinegar. And then he says, ni'm al-idam al-khal. Right? So what they're, what they're getting at here is that they're saying that what this is encouraging us is to not be, um, to not be ungrateful for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us and also not to harm the feelings of our family members. Right? Because she said it in a way kind of saying, like, I'm really sorry, I have nothing else to give you. And the Prophet ﷺ almost pra he praised it. He didn't almost praise it. He praised it in front of her as a way not to harm her, also as a way not to be ungrateful in front of Allah. And a person could say, I don't necessarily see why not, that that, that vinegar, the Prophet ﷺ wouldn't have said that unless vinegar had some type of trait that was praiseworthy. Because she said, I don't have anything other than vinegar. And he says, Dalika. No, he said, and he said that, excuse me, Jabran lil qalb, right? Or lil qalb man qaddamahu. So he said, as a way to like not break the heart of the one who gave it to him. The Prophet is asked by his wife for a condiment to eat his food, or asked his wife for a condiment to eat food. So she said to him, We do not have anything other than vinegar. He asked her to bring the vinegar. He then ate from it, continuously saying, A fine condiment vinegar is, a fine condiment vinegar is. So one thing we learn from this is that praising food is recommended, right? Praising it in a way that's not like, you know the people who are like gluttonous and they just love food? Not like that. But praising what Allah, being grateful for what Allah gave you. Right? Being grateful for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you. It is praiseworthy also to be frugal in eating and to deny oneself the pleasures of extravagant and appetizing foods. This helps one discipline their nafs and not always giving it, giving it to, giving it its desires. And finally, this hadith shows the magnificent character of the Prophet ﷺ and his great level of humility. He was not too proud to even praise vinegar. This shows that a husband should not be overly critical of his wife when it comes to food. And the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ was to be content with whatever it was available, no matter how simple it was. May the peace and blessings of God be upon him. Ali Afdal as any questions about this? Let me check online to make sure. Oh, there's no one else online, so we're okay. Alhamdulillah. Any questions? All right, let's keep going. Hadith 50. قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ هَلْ تُرْزَقُونَ وَتُنْصَرُونَ إِلَّا بِضُعَافَائِكُمْ رواه البخاري. The Messenger of Allah عليه وسلم, said, Are you not sustained and given victory? Right? You know, they're giving sustenance and victory except by the weakest amongst you. And here the commentators say what the Prophet ﷺ meant is aren't you aided and given victory against your enemies except through the weak of you? In other words, due to them, through the cause of them, because of the barakah of their making dua. And there are actually a genre almost of hadith like this where the Prophet ﷺ kind of flips the idea on its head, right? That actually the wealthy are given wealth only because of the poor. It's like the exact opposite of what you would think, right? So Allah only gives the wealthy their wealth for the poor, right? And here he says, the only reason you're given victory is because of the weak that are making dua basically amongst you. And he says, ask for the weak, in another version, because you're given sustenance and victory through your weak. That's from Abu Darda. 
So don't la taghtar, don't be deluded. Don't be deluded by your strength. And how many a story in the Prophet Sirah do we need that proves just exactly that point? Right? At Badr, there are like 308 maybe, right? 313 is the number, but some of them stayed behind, right? So, um, you know, like Sayyidina Uthman, he was with the Prophet's daughter. And he counted them amongst the people of Badr. So 313 is actually less than 313. They didn't have a lot of weapons. And then they were given victory against a thousand people who were fully equipped. But then at Hunayn, they were so many that they said, who is going to defeat us on this day? <laughs> right? And then they were almost defeated, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had the Prophet ﷺ succeed, but not due to their believing that they were strong. Right? And how does, he says, how many, the, the son of, uh, one of the children of Israel, so how many a small group defeated a larger group? Through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's victory. Right? Because there's something inside of them that despite their outward weakness, they were strong of heart. And so when the Prophet ﷺ says to the Sahaba, there will come a time when the communities, the nation states will surround you and they will like they will attack you the way that uh, you know people surround a plate and eat from a plate. And then they say, oh, is it because that we won't have a large number on that day? That's what they thought, right? And the Prophet ﷺ says, no, actually you'll be really large in number, but you'll be like the foam of the sea, right? So you'll be weak of heart, right? And so here the weakness is not weakness of heart, clearly not, right? These people are pious people, but they're praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't be deluded, he said. And also don't lose hope, right? The opposite of it. Don't lose hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give victory to whomever he pleases. Right? So this hadith is actually presented as a question, right? He says, but this is a rhetorical device or style often used by the Arabs to emphasize something. In other words, what the Messenger of Allah is saying, you are surely sustained and given victory only because of the weak amongst you. Because the weak and the destitute have been patient with God's decree over them. It's because of this group of people who face more trials and tribulations than most others that through their barakah, the community is given its sustenance and victory over its enemies. Therefore, one should not belittle these people, but rather show compassion and respect towards them. And you know, I remember, and I think I've mentioned this to you guys before, but I remember a particular, it's actually not a Muslim institution. Um, someone from that institution mentioned to me that like one of the things that really saddened him was that um, when he first, when they were trying to pull him in, they, uh, they gave him a lot of like attention. But then they realized that like his personality you know, he wasn't like leadership material. And I know him relatively well. So he's kind of, although he doesn't look it because he's like big and strong, he's kind of like a little more passive and kind of quiet and shy. So he isn't going to make a good leader. When they realize that, they stop giving him attention, right? Because they were looking for people who they could then flip, right? And then use to grow as an institution and grow as a, as a mission, right? And so, um, but that shows you like, the wrong thinking, right? You're not supposed to look just for the powerful and the strong. You're supposed to value people in and of themselves, right? And the Prophet والسلام, you know, the first group of people who entered into Islam, almost all of them were like the weak and the downtrodden. And Sayyidina Nuh, remember what they say to him in the Quran, they actually say to him, why should we follow you? Only the weak and like the unimportant are the ones who are around you, right? We're not going to follow you when you're like that. And it's one of the critical mistakes that we're making in the da'wah in, in the states is like basically we're trying to, as one person I know said to me recently, we're trying to convert the Abu Jahls, right? We're trying to convert the people who clearly are not only not interested, they're actively working against us, right? But then all the other people who are like open to it or like if you told them about Islam, they were like, we're not interested in them. Partially because of racism, partially because of classism, partially because of, of our own arrogance, like a whole bunch of reasons. We're leaving those people. Both across from one religion to another, but even internally as Muslims, like even amongst the Muslims, when we give da'wah, we give da'wah to the people who are really not interested in you giving da'wah to them. Right? And then the people who are interested, it's like we're ignoring them because they're weak in society or they're not wealthy or they're not what have you. And that's a mistake. It's a critical mistake. We shouldn't close the door on anyone, but, you know, clearly there are certain people who are more, um, that are more open to it than others. 
Okay, so he says indicates that the weak generally have more sincere intensity and sincerity and humility when making dua due to their hearts being less attached to distractions of this world and their genuineness and calling to, to out to Allah, the mighty and majestic. It also teaches the importance of humility, especially in one's interactions with others. Uh, although the poor and destitute may seem to be of a lower status, their rank with Allah exalted may far exceed one's own, making them worthy of respect and reverence. Cool. Hamda, any questions? Yes, mom. Sayyidina Ali. Sayyidina Ali were so. together looking for him and when yep. they came among the, the people, his people from Yemen, I believe. Yep. They asked, where do you know anyone by you know, uh, name of Uwais al Qurani? And nobody said, no, we don't know anyone whose name like this. And he kept asking because he was sure that it has to be one of them. And then at the end, uh, an old man he raised and he said, well, yeah, I know. I know this guy. He's like a relative of someone and he's the. Uh, He's caring for our animals. Caring for our, but he told him something that that's why I want to mention it. He said that this is not a very interesting person. He's yeah. just a poor person. He's no one, basically. No, but yeah, it's like no one. Yeah. Why you are asking for him? Yeah. And then that's subhanAllah, they say Ibn Umar and say Ibn Ali, they run. Yeah. And they captured him and he was praying. And then he asked, then, then when they made sure that he's the same person, that I saw something, because I think he had that kind of a, yeah, he had like a he had a skin disorder. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, the thing also that when they ask him, "What do you want?" So Sayyidina Umar, he's trying to ask him. Then, what do you want? You want me to assign you? You know, give me some money. I said, I don't need your money. I don't need anything. You know, I'm 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 doing very well. I'm mashallah. So that's a great jazakallah khair. I was actually thinking about him when we were saying al maru ma'man ahab too, yeah. because he loved the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but he couldn't come because he was caring for his mother. And uh, this is an example, also it also shows us the, the, the story is that people who are of a higher status can ask people of a lower status for dua. Because no one disputes that Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Umar are actually more meritorious in their, their rank than Abu Uwais al-Qarni um, because they're Sahaba and they're of Ajalis Sahaba, they're like the highest of Sahaba. And Abu Uwais, although he's an amazing person, the Prophet ﷺ prays, he hadn't even met the Prophet ﷺ, he wasn't a Sahabi, right? And so, but and then he told them, if you meet him, ask him to make dua for you, right? So it's a pretty amazing story. Allah reward you. Any other questions before we move to the last hadith? All right. So hadith fifty-one. قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم هلك المتنطعون رواه مسلم. The Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu salam, said, "Amjad translates as the obstinate are ruined, or ruined are the obstinate ones. Ruined are the obstinate ones." So there's different ideas of, of who these mutanati'un are, who these obstinate ones are. And one of them that's often cited are like the extremists. Um, whether they're extreme in their worship that doesn't follow the sharia. So Ghazali says, Ula'ika qawmun shaddadu ala anfusihim Allahu alayhim. There are people who were extreme or made it difficult on themselves, so Allah made it difficult upon them. Like a person who has waswasa. So he says, for example, you weren't commanded to pray with your yourself and your thobe actually pure, just that you believe that it's pure. <laughs> right? There's no way to know 100%. Right, and they give the examples of like uh, 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 monks, etc., as an example of that. Right, and then another group of people might be, or might also include al mutaammiquna al qaiduna fi ma la yu'nihim, the people who like in, in like just totally are invested in or are obsessed with what does not concern them. I wanted to share with you some hadith that I thought were really interesting that were related to this. 
this hadith about extremism is really profound. And it's narrated in Bazar, and also at Haytami said that the Sanad was sound, and Ibn Habban in his Sahih, and Abu Ya'la in his Musnad, and Ibn Kathir in his uh, also said that it was sound, and Al Tahawi, and Al Hurawi, and Ibn Asakir. So I'm going to read the Arabic first. وَقَدْ حَذَّرَ النَّبِي عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَةَ وَسَلَّمَ مِنْ هَذَا الْمَسْلَكِ التَّكْفِيرِ أَشَدِّ التَّحْذِيرِ فَعَنْ حُذَيْفَةَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى عَنْهُ قَالَ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ إِنَّمَا أَتَخَوَّفُ عَلَيْكُمْ رَجُلٌ قَرَأَ الْقُرْآنَ حَتَّى رُؤِيَتْ بَهْجَتُهُ عَلَيْهِ وَكَانَ رِدْءًا لِلْإِسْلَامِ غَيَّرَهُ إِلَى مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ فَانْسَلَخَ مِنْهُ وَنَبَذَهُ وَرَاءَ ظَهْرِهِ وَسَعَى عَلَى جَارِهِ بِالسَّيْفِ وَرَمَاهُ بِالشِّرْكِ قَالَ قُلْتُ يَا نَبِيَّ اللَّهِ أَيُّهُمَا أَوْلَى بِالشِّرْكِ الْمَرْمِي أَمْ الرَّامِي قَالَ بَلِ الرَّامِي So on the authority um, of Hudayfa, may God be well pleased with him. The Messenger of Allah said, He said, What I fear for you most is a man who recited the Qur'an until its effects of illumination became apparent on his face. And he became a defender and like a flag bearer of Islam. And then he changed its meanings to what Allah willed, meaning that he used it improperly. And it was yanked from him. And he placed it behind his back. And then he made way against his neighbor with a sword, unsheathed. And he accused him of polytheism. And then I said, O prophet of God, who is more deserving of being called a polytheist, the accuser or the accused? And he said, Nay, the accuser. Right? And there are a lot of hadith of this uh, formulaic structure and this kind of same meaning that, uh, you know, the people, the extremists, are, are, were, were, were forecasted by the Prophet ﷺ from the very beginning. Right? Um, one of them told the Prophet ﷺ that he was unhappy with the Prophet ﷺ's, uh, you know, uh, uh, decision. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, you know, from his descendants will be people that would, that would be extremists and they would kill the companions. And they did from the very beginning, right? And every generation has them. When they killed, they killed a group of them and Sayyidina Sayyidina Ali Islam, they said, okay, we defeated them. He said, no, they're like a snake. Every time you cut off its head, another head will appear. And then he said, um, until they're in the army fighting with the Dajjal. Right? And, um, you know, people who are extreme and are extremists, they're not following the Sunnah of the Prophet. He wasn't like that. There's nothing in his seerah that you see that. Nothing. His character was always the best. And he always treated people well. And he, in fact, didn't have two choices that were both valid, except that he chose the easier one. Right? And he never taught us to be hard on one another. And he never taught us to accuse people of polytheism. And yet, there are groups of people who basically their entire belief system is that everyone is a polytheist but themselves. This doesn't make any sense. Right? And it's not the religion of the Prophet Muhammad. And then another hadith that's kind of almost like the opposite, um, but is important. And I shared it with the group in Risala, but I'll share it with you. Um, Sheikh Jibril shared it with us, and I, it's like one of my favorite hadith now. An Ibrahim ibn Abdul Rahman al Udhri. قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يحمل هذا العلم من كل خلف عدوله ينفون عنه تحريف الغالين وانتحال المبطلين وتأويل الجاهلين on the authority of Ibrahim ibn Abdul Rahman al Udhri who said that the Messenger of Allah عليه وسلم said from every succeeding generation its upright folk shall carry the shall carry the knowledge in turn they shall repeal from it or repel from it its distortions excuse me, the distortions of the extremists, the misinterpretations of the ignorant, and the pretenses of the liars. Tabari Ahmad and others narrated it. right? And that's one of the meanings of the Prophet ﷺ saying that uh, an, a scholar is better than a thousand worshippers, right? Because he or she is able to give light to darkness and show you what's right and from what's wrong. Because people think that being hard-hearted and strict is, is more pious, but it's not. Because that's not how the Prophet said. That's real bid'ah. Like the real bid'ah is to think that you're more religious than the Prophet. Right? The real bid'ah is actually to say, no, no, I'm going to do it better than the Prophet did it. Oh, you know, I have proof that he didn't know it's not, it's not enough for me. Or to say that you're better than the Sahaba or that you're better than the Salaf. 
right? All of whom did things that you're saying people shouldn't do. That's real extremism. Um, and then obviously killing the believers is a form of kufur. And it's not, by kufur, we don't necessarily mean that they left Islam. But it's like the epitome of ingratitude. It's the epitome of the act of disbelief. Even though not necessarily you're a disbeliever, but by killing another believer or accusing him of being a disbeliever. The Prophet said, if you accuse someone of being a polytheist or disbeliever, you yourself will are polytheist or disbelief. Right? If that person isn't themselves. Right? And by that, what he may, means is what you've done is a horrible, horrible thing. So here the obstinate is those who are stubborn in taking severe rulings in matters of which there is some flexibility. And they're ruined. They will face ruin in the next life. And this is a serious hadith of implication of extreme positions. The obstinate is someone who is extreme and excessive in their actions and speech in regards to their religion. In other words, the people who are stubborn, hard-hearted, and extreme in their beliefs and religious practice will face a disastrous end, <coughs> as seen in the several previous hadith. Um, Islam encourages a middle way approach in matters of religion. It is the devil who pushes people towards extremes, effectively destroying the spirit of their faith. This trend is especially dangerous today because many try to appear strict and religious in their own outward appearance, meanwhile losing the spirit of their faith by judging others and taking other extreme positions. Right? And so we're encouraged, obviously, to be people of middle path. And when it comes to difficult rulings, you can be difficult on yourself without being difficult on other people. Right? Fine, you want to take like a more cautious position, that's great. But you don't have to tell other people that they, you, you're not supposed to hold other people to that. Particularly when there's differences of opinion. It doesn't make any sense for you to hold people to the most difficult position when there's differences of opinion about that position. Right? So you should just leave people alone. That's part of Sheikh Abdul Karim was just mentioning in Glorious Treasure about um, uh, in the Book of Intentions about calling to good and forbidding evil, that there's rules to it. One of the rules is that you have to know that there's agreement amongst the scholars on it. If there's any disagreement, then you can't call to her and you can't prohibit it. Right? So, Halak al mutanatti'un, he said, ruined are the obstinate quarrelers. Right? And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, protect us from those types of people. And, um, you know, look for people who remind you of Allah. If the first thing that people are teaching you is everyone else who's a disbeliever, and it's just like a list of people who are bad that are not them, that's a bad sign. It's a bad sign. Because that's not how the Prophet ﷺ taught the religion. The first thing they teach is not, look at all these other misguided people. right? The first thing they teach is about Allah and the Prophet ﷺ and basic worship and, and these types of things. They don't teach these, these, these other forms. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us uh, from these types of people and may protect the ummah from it and protect us from those who are investing in them so that they can see the ummah fall apart. الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين. Any questions before we end? الحمد لله. We didn't make up that much time. Yeah, go ahead, Ala. On yourself or on others? On yourself, you should do it in balance that you can keep, because the shaytan. He will encourage you to take the, the hardest and the most intense as like a trick to get you to stop, right? So, for example, you'll start fasting during Ramadan, and then after Ramadan, he'll tell you, okay, now that you fasted during Ramadan, fast every other day. And then you'll do it for like a week, and then you'll stop. As opposed to taking maybe a first step being fast three days out of the month, right? He, he pushes you forward because he knows that you'll trip and you'll stop, right? Um, so uh, do it in sta stages that you can upkeep, right? And um, you know you find that in every part of your life. That's the most intelligent thing to do. But you should be scrupulous on yourself. The more the merrier, the better. Especially if you're ready for it. Um, but be careful, because what you really want is not to be hard on yourself. What you want is to follow the sunnah and overcome your ego. So the Imam al-Busliri mentions in the poem that perhaps your hunger is actually an egotistical thing. Like perhaps you don't eat and you fast or you don't eat a lot and it's actually just a way of like pleasing your ego. Right? Because you say, oh, look at me. Like I don't eat and I'm fasting a lot. Right? Um, and so the key is not to be difficult or to be hard on yourself. The key is to be in line with the sunnah and to be in line with what the Prophet ﷺ came with and to overcome uh, your lower desires and your passions.
Yeah, cool. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so we did go over a little bit. So um, looking at our schedule, we were supposed to finish at 4.15. It's 4.27. Our next session is supposed to be 4.35. I'm guessing Sheikh Abdul Karim hopefully will not mind if we start maybe five minutes later, 4.40. That'll give you 15 minutes. Alhamdulillah. Allah reward you all. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>